Okay, uh, Ellsworth was taking a picture right there, so I'm gonna make sure I get my good side, so I'll get back up. <laughs> okay, great. Because I got tired of him getting me at the Batman angle. And I'll put me up there on the uh, on the slides. How about once more? I'm looking around, I'm seeing some happy, smiling faces. Was the breakfast good? Great, great, great. I'm glad the breakfast is good this morning because if the breakfast is not good this morning, it's going to be bad for the keynote speaker. <laughs> so you are fed, and now I want to take a little time and speak with you this morning. Welcome to this Yellow Ribbon event, Houston, Texas. Before I begin, I want to thank the Yellow Ribbon leadership for this opportunity to speak with you this morning and share with you three purposes of Yellow Ribbon Event. Number one, to share experiences and receive resources on how to stay life balanced before, during, and after being deployed. Number two, focus on building stronger relationships with family and on friends. Three, provide healthy management tools for everyday living. As a first sergeant, and having been in the military more than 30 years, I have witnessed challenging events before, during, and after deployment that negatively affected airmen, their friends, and family. Having been through a few of my challenges myself, I feel a key is to pass on advice and or direct people to resources that help them have the strength to not only accept, but to grow in what happens to them in life. Here's what I've learned from my life challenges and by witnessing others. We all carry what I call a life backpack. Our life backpack is for our journey that's called living life. Some of you might have noticed my backpack. It is warm, Hammered in some places, and it even has blue paint on it. This backpack and I have been on a long journey together, in which I will share some of my journey with you later. Over a period of time, we pick up items that we can mentally carry, which represents the physical. This forces us to put our backpack down temporarily, but we don't separate from it permanently because everything inside that backpack is deemed valuable. Simultaneously, thunderstorms, which represent life challenges, are approaching, and the direction we need to go is through those thunderstorms. As the severe thunderstorms, begin to rage above, we are trying to figure out what we need to take out of our backpack in order to lighten. My topic to you this morning is lighten your backpack. Lighten your backpack. Now audience, you don't get to participate in my presentation this morning. When you hear me say, if this is in your backpack, what are you going to do? I'm going to point to you. You're going to say to the top of your voice, take it out. Okay, let's have a dry run. If this is in your backpack, what are you going to do? Take, take it, it out. out. Great. Take it out. The key is to focus on what we can do and not on the situation affecting us. So I'm going to provide with you eight recommendations for going through life challenges Simultaneously lighten your backpack. Don't isolate yourself. As a first sergeant, I've met airmen who returned from a deployment acting as if they're still deployed away from family, friends. I've also met spouses who isolated themselves and their children from returning military members because they did not want to go through the emotional trauma of having to leave them again. Both approaches 
caused people being isolated from each other. With that rationale, that if I isolate myself, no one will notice the difference in my behavior. 90% of the time, this was not true. The parties affected knew right away. Isolation caused the breakdown of communication and created a lack of trust. I recommend when you start feeling this way, reach out. Vera Nazarene said, sometimes reaching out and taking someone else's hand is the beginning of a journey. At times, it is allowing another to take over. So, if isolation is in your backpack, what are you going to do? Take it out. Take isolation out of your backpack. And tell the person who matters most how you really feel inside. At work, it's probably not a good idea to do that. To tell your boss how you really feel. Imagine you going to the gym. Jim, let me tell you how I really feel. He'll be like, okay, uh, uh, former uh, senior master sergeant Smith, now I'm senior airman Smith. And it's probably not a good thing to do. Some people, I term, have what I call two faces. The face that they want you to see, and the real one on the inside, like the picture of people facial expressions that you see on the screen. This should not be the case in personal relationships. I recommend you wait for the right opportunity to convey your feelings using tact. Try not to hold things in too long. Have you ever met someone who held everything in? And then one day, there's a new explosion. Uh, would you get me the cell phone? Cell phone, you want the cell phone? You want? The cell phone? You want it? Take it. Take it. And all of a sudden, there's a nuclear explosion. Well, some people tend to hold things in. I want to ask the spouses and family members a question for a minute. How many spouses told their significant other how they really felt the first time they heard that the significant other was the point? Y'all better answer that right now. Because it may cause conflict, we just got here. Wait till tomorrow. So, if holding things in is in your backpack, what are you going to do? Take, Take it out. out. Take it out of your backpack. When people don't tell people how they really feel inside of the people who deserve to know, sometimes they tell others, and you have to be careful who you talk to. Some people have the personality I call dumpsters. They wait for people to bring them their trash. Instead of being objective, they add to your suffrage because they are toxic from everyone else dumping garbage in them. Some people are garbage trucks, their personality. They walk around the workplace looking for garbage to take in. They are the ones who seem concerned about you when actually it's all about them and their drama. Their timing is impeccable. When you least expect it, they will come find you. <laughs> if you're not careful, they will take your garbage with others and dump it in the landfill. People who are dumpsters and trash trucks have capacity limits. People who are landfills don't. They expand. Landfills are people who gather negative information from dumpsters and trash trucks and use that negative information to pit people against one another. They create an environment of negativity. They always see obstacles instead of opportunities and they create strife and stifle created ideas. Yet, they hide under the cloak of servicing the greater good. I was employed at a college, 
And you know that the day, the first day of your employment, you go see human resources and uh, they give you or present you an employee handbook. You read the policies of the do's and don'ts of the organization. What interested me about the college when I, when I read about it, they had something that was called a no gossiping policy. And it said that if you were caught gossiping, you could be administratively disciplined or leading and off to termination. This is a good place to work. <laughs> Two weeks in, I signed my, uh, my, my handbook, got my copy, I was good to go. Well, two weeks later, we had a meeting. It was the chancellor in there and a couple executives, including myself. We had the formal portion of our meeting. The meeting was over, so the executive left out. The chancellor stood up. He said, let me tell you what's been going on at the college. He was telling us everyone's personal business. It didn't have anything to do with employee productivity or organizational performance. I raised my hand and said, sir, could you go back and tell me about the last slide again as to change the subject? And he said, uh, well, let me get through doing what this. And there was actually a dump truck and a garbage dumpster in the meeting too who said, no, tell me more, tell me more. Imagine I felt very uncomfortable working at a place like that. So my first chance to find unemployment, I left. Man, I left out of there because I could not be in that environment. So, because I found out something. If you associate yourself with a person who has the personality of a dumpster, trash truck, or landfill, you will start being negative. Joyce Meyer maintained, being negative only makes a journey more difficult. You may be given a cactus, but you don't have to sit on it. <laughs> so if that dumpster, trash truck, or landfill is in your backpack, what are you gonna do? Take it out. Take it out. Take that trash collector out of your backpack. When you are on this journey, sometimes you have to find inspiration when it's hard to. After my second appointment as an E5, I returned to work only to be laid off a few weeks later. After I got back, I had to pawn my TV, my mortgage payment, got three months behind. I took a temporary job stacking steel. There was several times during this part of my journey when I had two pieces of pork chop and a large can of beef stew the last me a week. My electricity was cut off, but I continued to go to school because I didn't want everything taken away from me. I tried to find ways, uh, you know, to inspire myself. I even uh, took a college course at the time's ironic, which was called Introduction to Film. And we were covering different genres of film. And in this case, we were talking about drama. I told my instructor, I don't need to learn about drama. I've got no drama in my life right now. So when my battery uh, operated a radio, I tried to find ways to inspire myself. It worked sometimes, and sometimes it did not work. Then something different happened. I began to mark progress in my life by the number of days I experienced. Meaning, I took each day as an opportunity to learn something, and that was free. School was a routine to me, and I didn't really care. I'm, I'm going to share something with you right now in the audience, and uh, I, I tell my wife about it, I'm going to tell too many people this. It took me six and a half years to get my first associate's degree. And I graduated with a 2.05 GPA at that time. And I had this attitude, as long as I got a C, it was all right with me. <laughs> and then one day, sitting on a porch, 
after a severe thunderstorm watching it, I noticed there was two rainbows similar to the picture behind me. Gloria and Kate shared this perspective. We may run, walk, stumble, drive, or fly, but never lose sight of the reason for the journey or miss a chance to see a rainbow on the way. I told myself, if I keep going, something is going to break. Two weeks later, while talking to headquarters AFRC on the phone, they asked me if I was interested in taking the deployment to Korea, which I took. If doubt is in your backpack, what are you going to do? Take it out. Take it out. Take it out of your backpack. Completing this part of the challenging part of my journey gave me confidence to engage adversity with determination. To get to a place you've never been in life, you have to do something you've never done. Adversity builds us. Use it as an opportunity to incorporate life skills necessary to get over your obstacles. What I went through after my deployment gave me the confidence that I can do anything. I became a military training instructor. As a military training instructor student, and that picture right there that you see, oh, that was just me greeting some ROTC cadets and welcoming, welcoming them to Lackland and letting them know how much I appreciate them so much. I just couldn't wait till they got off the bus, so I went over there and encouraged them to like to get off. Yes, that's my story. I'm sticking with that story. All right, yes. I welcomed them to my humble abode. It was all about them. Now, the next picture that you see, I was actually playing as a terrorist with security forces who happened to be here today. And that was me with two nine millimeters taking care of my airmen. Yes. And when they tried to surrender, I said, look, don't let me shoot you in the back. Turn around and face me. And I commenced to bust those caps. <laughs> As an MTI student, four weeks into the program, something happened. I had my car, which weighed 3,500 pounds, on four jack stands. And I was underneath it, working on it like this, trying to get the dry shaft out. My left shoulder was on the ground. My right shoulder was facing this way, had about two or three inches of clearance. While I was working on it, trying to get that dry shaft out, I pulled really hard, and I heard something. Boom! The car began to fall forward like this, and I instinctively knew that if I stayed this way, I would have been crushed. So what I did was turn this way, and turn my head this way, and that 3,500 pound car fell on top of me. And it was pushing down on top of me, across my back and everything. For five to six minutes, I was down there and the car had me pinned. I couldn't get up. I had to sit there and wait. Some Navy guys came by on the other side and they tried to pull me up. And I said, the car had me pinned. I could feel the weight of the car push across my back and it was pushing me across the skull, just like this. They tried to push the car forward, and when they did that, the car cut deeper into my back. I said, guys, push the car the other way. When they pushed the back and the jack stand was still laying down like this, they were locked, they pushed it back. What, I jumped up real quick, and they were looking at me. I said, the car just fell on me. And they said, yeah, we know that. You better sit down. It was <laughs> blood pouring everywhere. Everywhere. The ambulance came, the med tech came. It was just a scene out there. My supervisor came out there. She was like, ah! oh, 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 oh. <laughs> She saw all the blood. She just knew I was a martyr. I said, ma'am, calm down. I don't need 
the drama because I make a blood spot pumping and we're both panicked, I may pass out. <laughs> we got on the gurney, put me on the gurney for a minute. The first thing I noticed, my lesson plans for the NTI program was in the back seat. I said, hey guys, go get my lesson plans. Because when you're an NTI student back in the old days, if you left your lesson plans anywhere, it would be up a flagpole somewhere in BMT, and you have to go try to go find it. So I know because what happened to me, they were not going to let you know put my you know put my flag on uh, my lesson plans on the flagpole. They was going to do that, but I didn't want to take a chance. I said, listen, go get my lesson plans. And the other girl said, you sure? I said, listen, we're not leaving until we get it. <laughs> he came, gave me my lesson plans. I held it for dear life. Me, the lesson plans went into the gurney, and off to the hospital we went. Robbed that open hole. The doctor was sitting there looking at me, and I'm looking at the doctor. He said, how are you still alive? He said, I have the x-ray right here. He said, let me tell you what's wrong with you. He said, you're crushed down to your skull. Your skull is indented just a little bit. He showed me a mirror. I could see my skull. It was actually white. He said, you see your x-ray right here? You have, you see how two of your ribs are turned in this way a little bit? He said, because they're dislocated. And he said, you have pain along the ribs and everything? I said, yes, I do. He said, you probably have anywhere between six to eight bruised ribs. He said, it's going to take you 20, at least 20 stitches and 20 staples to sew you back up. You have two large lacerations that are about two inches wide. They span across the width of your back. If that car would have went down another quarter of an inch, you would probably be paralyzed for the rest of your life. I said, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that I will no longer be in the MCI program? He said, yes. He said, uh, it's over. You could probably apply later. I said, no, you, you're not going to do that to me. I then come away from South Carolina just to be sent back and scraped. What point I'm trying to make? If you really want to do something, you will find a way to do it. Because that's how you engage diversity with determination. I said, you saw me up? I'm going to walk out of this hospital. Six hours later, I walked out of that hospital at my own house. He said, you sure you want to do this? I said, yes, I do. So for the next six weeks, I was in intense pain, taking a lot of Motrin. I couldn't lay in the bed. I had to sleep on my left side in a, in a couch. And I would get maybe one or two hours of sleep, wake up, and then take my pain medication, get back in there and do the same thing again. So my last evaluation as a military training instructor was an exercise that was called control margin of flight. And what happened, the MTI student would end up going to the drill card, calling the commands to become certified. That was my last step. So the back said, are you ready, Sergeant Smith? I said, I am ready. The trailer was pumping. I was ready to go. My flight lined up. We came in our first forward drill marching movement. I gave the command. The, the trailer was pumping. I said, halt, halt. And at that minute, that minute, one of our dislocated ribs popped back in place. And I said, flight halt at ease, vibrate. And it went down just like this. And you know sometimes when you're in so much pain, you got to hold yourself. You got to talk to yourself. You got to hold yourself. And at that minute, I turned on the mouth and, and the back of came on. He said, Sergeant Smith, are you okay? You sure you want to stop? I said, no. But deep down I said I was crying. I turned around, face toward the wind, kind of wiped my eyes real quick. He said, you really want to do this? I said, listen, I'm going to home stretch now. I'm going to do this. We went through that evaluation card, came back. My flight knew what was going on with me.
Because they were with me for five weeks. They knew what I was going through. They look at me, their eyes were popping like this, but nobody said nothing. <laughs> My eyes were popping, and I was like, don't y'all say anything. I'll do like a predator and rip somebody's heart right out of their home. <laughs> We're not going to do that. So my dog keep looking at me. I said, listen, y'all, I'm fine. Are y'all ready? They were like, Moby, yes, sir. And when something happened, we began to inspire one another. Went through the car and passed. I got my campaign hat two weeks later. If you don't have what you need internally to get adversity with determination, you this yellow ribbon event to get what you need externally. This yellow ribbon event had professional staff, resource providers, and dynamic breakout presenters, including yours truly, moi, <laughs> that will be teaching later on. With so much information to share, get that information and tap in those resources from this event and share what you have learned with other members, family, or friends. Some people going through their life challenges may need help and don't know how to get it. So, if lack of determination is in your backpack, what are you going to do? Take it out. Take it out. Take it out of your backpack. It all starts with how you see yourself. The forward positive movement between where you are today and where you may come tomorrow is motivation. Do you motivate yourself internally or rely on people externally? It should be a combination of both. Externally, the key is to know how far to go with people. You have to treat some people like you're on an elevator. Although they are pushing the buttons, you have to know when to get off, or you'll miss your forward destination. Internally, it's pretending what you want to be. Michael Batsy Johnson challenged us when he said, don't pretend to be what you're not. Instead, pretend what you want to be, if not, Pretense, it is a journey to self-realization. Uh, from 10 years old, uh, my father used to always tell me stories about the Air Force and the places he traveled all over the world. And you know, when I was 13 years old, having him tell me the same stories, I really got excited about, you know, joining the Air Force. So I went to a pawn shop and I bought it. Two master sergeant stripes, and not the one with the rocker on it, the one with the six stripes all around the globe. You know, old folks like Chief that's on the dude back there, he know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Chief hurt these hardcore veterans, they know what I'm talking about, and I had these stripes. I went to Kmart and I actually bought a dog blue blazer jacket, and I sold these stripes on one night of sale. I sold them on. Walked around, raiding around the house, all on the joint air force. I even bought one of those camouflage honey hats, and I'll put it on every picture you see me standing there with those stripes on the joint air force. So when I turned 19 years old, I went to New York City back home and visited Fort Hamilton, New York. I applied to be in the air force, and I never did get my recruiting name. His name is Staff Sergeant Alfred E. Perkins. He said, hey, Sergeant Cameron Smith, are you ready? I said, yes, I am. Because, you know, back then, everybody came to this mirror and was a truck. The day that you, you put your hands on, you were an airman in the United States Air Force. So I took the AFAB test. He called me two weeks later. He said, uh, Aaron Smith, uh, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. He said, what do you want? which one do you want to go first? I said, tell me the, the good news. He said, you passed the AFAB test. I was like, what? <laughs> I said, well, there could be any bad news in this. Could it? What's the bad news? He said, you passed for all branches except the Air Force. <laughs> 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 Couldn't work for losing. He said, well, here's the bright spot. Go get an AFAB test. 
study about it. Take the test again and then practice up. Let's see how you do. I took the test again, and this time I passed. And I joined the United States Air Force. What I'm trying to give you a point here to focus on is stop saying what you can't do. And how you see yourself today will project you and motivate you to start telling you what you can do to any circumstances you may encounter. So, if short-term motivation is in your backpack, what are you going to do? Take it off. There you go. Take it off. Somebody's feeling better than that corn right there. Somebody's getting hacked. Somebody's like, take it off. There you go. Help yourself. And never let the circumstances define you. When circumstances or others define you, you cannot control your destiny or influence the income, the outcome. You see this uh, picture here? I actually graduated from the first public academy. And I can honestly tell you it wasn't really a good experience for me. I was, uh, because of my seniority, I was actually a class leader. So a couple of days after passing our PT test, we did something that was called cone relay circuits. And let me explain. The cones were spread out about 100 to 20 feet apart. The class will form up, run to the first cone, and when you arrive at the set of cones, there was a card indicating what exercises to perform. So in this case, the first cone you arrive there, you'd have to end up doing 15 pull, you know, 15 push-ups. We get there, get in the circle, perform the exercises, get up, do our class chant, and we would spread off to the next set of cones. Well, by the time I got to the fourth cone, I noticed two of my classmates were still at cone three and they were struggling. After they got through doing what, after they got to complete cone four exercises, they took off, they ran. I stayed behind to rejoin them. They said, hey, you know, hey, class, what you doing with us? I said, I'm here to encourage you guys. So, you know, let's all do it together. We finished. 15 minutes behind the class. The instructor was there. He said, uh, everybody did good, but we had some struggles, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. He said, right now, shower, everything else, meet us in the class at 8.30, so I can give everyone the agenda that's going to be covered that day. So practicing excellent 